All right, so let's get started. So uh, I'm very excited today because uh, previous days we are talking about models and applications, but today we are going to have a uh, theory talk, okay? So it's my great pleasure to introduce you, Toyima. So Toyima is an assistant professor of computer science at Stanford University. So he did his PhD uh, in uh, Princeton with Sanju Aurora in his undergrad at Tsinghua. So his research interests include topics in machine learning, algorithms, and their theories, such as deep learning, uh, reinforcement learning, pre-training, foundation models, etc. So um, he has done a lot of great works, including award-winning um, papers at Near East and Coast. So today he's going to tell us about three facets of what's understanding pre-training, self-supervised laws, inductive bias, and implicit bias. So yeah, back to you. Okay. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me here. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, I, I'm going to talk about understanding pre-training, and this is joint work with um, a bunch of students at Stanford, Jeff, Hao Chen, Ananya Kumar, uh, Michael Xie, Hong Liu, Kendrick Shen, Yobi Jones, and uh, there are some of the other uh, more senior people on the team um, who graduated or who are colleagues um, uh, at Stanford with me, uh, Colin Ji Yuan and uh, Adrian Gaiden, who is from TRI, and Percy Liang, who is my colleague at Stanford. Okay, so um, I guess um, um, should I, oh I don't have to okay. So I guess um, probably people are familiar with pre-training here. Uh, I'm just gonna um, briefly talk about you know um, the pre-training representations. This is uh, something that um, pre-training is one of the the very hot topics these days, and which can seems to uh, made um, make uh, significant progress in the last few years that drives the, the kind of like the progress of AI in the last few years. So basically the idea is that you pre-train some representations from unlabeled data. Um, and this means that you map the raw data uh, to some vectors from, for example, images. And then, and this card called representations may be embeddings that sometimes they are called feature extractors. And then you learn some, uh, for example, linear heads on top of the representations on some labeled downstream tasks. You just do linear classifications with these representations. Of course, there are many other ways to use the representations. You could do, uh, for example, full fine tuning, uh, where uh, you tune the linear head and the representation of the feature tractor together, or you could do even uh, uh, other things like these days you can do zero shot in context learning, so on and so forth, right? So, um, but here for this task, for this talk, I'm going to focus on this, just a simple linear uh, classification on the linear head or linear probe uh, in this day's uh, language. So, um, so, so the point is that we want to understand why these kind of like representations can be useful so that uh, they can be useful for the downstream tasks. In other words, why the representations are linearly separable for the downstream tasks. Um, so I'm kind of like a theoretician uh, in some sense. So, um, so I care about why and when and how does this pre-training work. Um, I guess you, if you unpack this question, um, there might be multiple you know, aspects there. Um, I guess the, the main re the question is that why you can pre-train on unlabeled data, but still this pre-train representation can help a wide range of downstream tasks that are labeled. So, so certainly this pre-training can provide some label efficiency uh, than training from scratch. You know, if you pre-train with unlabeled data, you need much fewer uh, data points for downstream tasks. And somehow also what's fantastic is that the pre-train representations are somewhat universal in, in the sense that you only need one pre-train representation um, to work for many, many downstream tasks. And, and this pre-train representation is only learned from pretty much one unlabeled uh, or unsurprised um, pre-training loss. So somehow this unsurprised pre-training loss seems to be a universal, uh, universally useful loss for many, many downstream tasks. And of course, you know, if you push on very diverse unlabeled data, you somehow also get some robustness uh, benefits compared to just training from scratch. Uh, um, this, I'm putting a question mark here because, um, so exactly how, you know, how much robustness you gain uh, is still kind of like a little bit questionable. For example, whether um, you can extrapolate beyond uh, what's covered in the unlabeled data, you know, empirically it's still not exactly known, but, but we have seen, you know, absolutely speaking, we have seen that uh, the robustness of this uh, pre-trained models are very, very good. So, um, you know, at least much better than before. 
And from a um, theoretical perspective, I guess the the question is that how do you not only necessarily how do you uh, kind of solve each of these question, um, but also how do you kind of like uh, uh, have a systematic understanding of, about this? Because this is a really a paradigm change of AI, uh, which seems to be significant enough for us to think about, you know, a deep and systematic understanding. And um, and I think the the kind of the the, the challenge is that you one has to do something really beyond classical theory because in most of the classical statistical learning theory, um, you don't allow uh, um, different training and test tasks, right? So, so in, the, in the new theory, I think the key is that we need to allow different training and test tasks. So the classical learning theory sometimes allow, you know, um, different training and test distributions, but um, they also always require the same uh, tasks in the training and test time. And this, you know, seemingly small uh, issues seems to be a, a real issue that um, that makes all the classical learning theory results don't apply. So, and uh, another thing is that because all of these foundation model, like pre-training uh, models, uh, they are used using very huge nonlinear models, you know, with transformers, all of this kind of like gigantic new networks. Um, one has to build a theory that is somewhat integrative with uh, deep learning theory. Uh, so that you can allow nonlinear models. Um, however, uh, you don't want to just uh, reduce to the difficulty of, you know, you want to re just reduce your problem to some kind of hardcore um, um, question about deep learning theory, because then, you know, you got into all of these optimization issues, generalization issues that we haven't understood even in super learning. So in some sense, we need a kind of understanding that can somehow abstract away some aspects that are already challenging in supervised deep learning for example, non-convex optimization, so that you can focus on the specific part about pre-training uh, instead of just worry too much about non-linear models. All right, I'm not saying I have a real framework like this, but uh, but I think this is the probably the data data for us to, uh, to build more systematic understanding, uh, just at least in my opinion. Okay, so um, these are just some high level kind of thoughts about this area about pre-training, understanding pre-training. And um, let me kind of like uh, dive into some of the um, the progress um, that we made in the last few years. Um, I guess uh, there are three parts of this talk. The first part is about um, um, the loss function. And, uh, and then we are gonna talk more about, you know, the inductive bias of the architectures and the implicit bias of the optimizers role uh, in this uh, uh, self-supervised learning. So, um, but, the first, but the first part is probably the main part where we study uh, why does the loss function and give us um, 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 uh, why does the what's the role of the loss function in this uh, pre-training uh, problem? So, in particular, we'll focus on contrastive loss, which is um, one of the popular loss in vision uh, that can be used to learn unsurprised, uh, can be used to learn these uh, representations for um, visual data. Okay, so I guess the reason why I'm structuring the talk like this and also why the, we are doing the research like this is because we want to isolate. Um, the, the first thing we you know, started you know, probably two or three years ago is that we want to isolate the loss function. In some sense, you, there are so many things that affects this, uh, uh, the performance, right? So the loss function architecture and so forth. And you want to isolate uh, each of them so that you can understand uh, each part separately. And uh, the way to isolate loss function is that you want to assume that you have sufficient data. For example, you have polynomial number of data points uh, in the unsupervised um, pre-training, so that um, so that um, uh, you can uh, somehow isolate the loss function. So um, let me just takes a minute to try to remove this bar. Uh, oh, I'm not sure whether you see my screen, but the the zoom bar covers my. Slides. How do I minimize it? Okay. Anyway, I put it here. Okay. So um, sorry. So so basically, we are assuming you have sufficient data. Maybe the number of data points is bigger than the model class of the pre-trained model, and um, uh, and then with this abstraction, you know that before you are um doing uh, in the so-called empirical precision loss and the empirical data points you are collecting, you collected. And now because you assume you have sufficient data, then you pretty much say, okay, you actually um, um, working with the population 
purchasing lots because they are closed by just the off the shelf kind of concentration in the quality, you know, just because you have enough data. And the same thing uh, uh, happens for uh, the downstream classification loss, right? So a downstream task, you have uh, just a linear logistic regression task, um, and um, you have some empirical downstream loss, which is the, just the linear uh, logistic regression empirical loss. And uh, if you have sufficient data that's in, you know, close to the population uh, downstream loss, so um, if uh, you have sufficient data, basically pretty much what I'm saying is that you can focus on the population part instead of the uh, empirical part. And this uh, uh, relationship is actually close to be true, uh, which is also a nice uh, empirically, which is also a nice thing uh, about this because in deep learning, you know, uh, in a typical supervised learning, the empirical losses and, and population loss are not that close. But in pre-training, uh, the empirical loss and population loss are very close. So, and uh, once you believe in this kind of concentration between the empirical and population loss, then you may say, you may just uh, uh, as well assume that there are infinite data points. So then this pretty much is the first question we care about, you know, even if you are given infinite data in the pre-training and downstream task, why pre-training helps downstream tasks? So the question now becomes that, you know, if you learn this data hat from the population pre-training loss, why this data had a lot, and let's call this data had the preaching model. Why this data had allows um, the existence of some downstream hat, uh, which we call gamma, such that if you look at downstream loss um, on the preaching model and the gamma, uh, that's small. So in other words, why does the preaching representations are linearly separable? So I guess you can see that to understand this question, in some sense, you know, there's no way that this is universally true, right? So it's not like you can push on any unlabeled data and uh, and that can help, you know, any downstream tasks. If your unlabeled data is kind of like, um, has no internal structure, for example, suppose your X, right? The data distribution of X is just um, um, IAD Gaussian, like spherical Gaussian, then there's no structure. Then learning from the unlabeled data just doesn't help you anything. So, so the question, um, the answer really is kind of like this, right? So you have to say that the pre-training and downstream task has some relationship. And how does this relationship, how do you bridge them? Um, I think the way that we do it is that, or maybe the general way to do it is also like this, um, which is, you know, you somehow say that a pre-training loss uh, should capture some structure of the unlabeled data. And this kind of structure is encoded in the representations of the data hat, uh, the, in the representation model data hat. And then the unlabeled, um, this unlabeled structure that you encode it in the representation actually help you to, um, um, to solve the, uh, the downstream task. Uh, and if the downstream task has some kind of like depend on the same type of structure. Um, and then the same type of structure helps downstream tasks. So, um, so the question is how is exactly do this, you know, for um, different precision laws and different data distribution. And what we are doing is that we have an instantiation of this kind of um, plan for the contrastive loss. And another kind of like small caveat here is that our challenge here is that you also have to say this information uh, is encoded in the representation um, model in a linear way so that this um, downstream task can be solved uh, with a linear classification hat. So um, let's focus on the uh, contrast of loss in the next few slides, you know, at least next five to 10 slides. So um, um, just a very brief introduction of contrast of learning if you are not familiar with it. So this is one of the popular way uh, to learn visual representations. So um, what you do is you say there's a notion of augmentation in the visual world, right? So you can flip, you know, crop, you know, randomly um, flip and crop and uh, um, of the image. And you can also do some kind of like random color scheme uh, changing of the image. So, um, and those are called augmentations. And the positive pair is, uh, means that you have two augmentations, two random augmentations of the same image. And you want those augment, uh, uh, positive pairs to have close nearby representations. Pretty much, for example, you just generate some kind of like two uh, representations or augmentations of the dog, and then you want these two um, patches uh, to have similar representations. And then you also have uh, um, uh, a negative 
uh, um, pair, which means that you have augmentations of two uh, random images, for example, augmentation of a dog and a cat, and then you want this, them to have distant uh, representations. So, um, so this makes a lot of sense. Of course, you know, as you see that um, these uh, negative pairs are not entirely negative because you don't really know which image is what, right? So you could have two dog images, they are considered as two images, and you generate two patches of these two different dogs, and they are still considered as negative pairs. So, so in some sense, you know, the negative pairs could also contain some of the negative pairs actually are pairs that are supposed to have close back representations, but you still try to uh, put them far away. So the question is why by doing this somehow it achieves the right balance such that, you know, like the dogs have similar representations and cats have similar representations and they are linearly separable. So um, the main point we make here is that um, um, the, main, the main point of theory kind of like uh, um, achieve is that we prove that contrastive learning is a kind of spectral uh, clustering on infinite graph. So, and this infinite graph is a, a, a special graph that we built uh, on the population data. So, um, and you'll see why this makes sense. So, and if you believe in this, then basically what is going on is that uh, the contrastive learning pretty much just uh, um, encodes the graph information into Euclidean uh, space. So that there you have Euclidean structures in the representation space, which is kind of like the, the graph structure, uh, uh, the classical structure in the graph. And then if your downstream task is compatible with the classical structure, then uh, you can solve the, uh, the task with the representations. So what is this, um, this graph, which is the central object here? So the graph is so-called the population positive paragraph, which as the name suggests, come from the positive pair. So pretty much what you do is that you say, every image patch are uh, in the vertex set, and uh, you have some edges uh, uh, on this graph, and the graph is, the edges are defined to be um, all the pairs such that they share the, or all the positive pairs that they share the original image, right? If two images, two image patches have the same original image, then you say they have um, positive pairs, and then you add the edge in this graph. Know that this graph is huge because you have all the possible image patches in this world. So, however, this graph is also extremely sparse because um, there are very, very um, a few uh, image pairs that can have uh, the same original image, right? Basically, you just need these two images to be very, very close in up to rotation, cropping, so on and so forth, so that uh, they can be extremely, um, they can be uh, augmentations of the same image. So, so this graph is really huge and sparse um, just because positive pairs are very, very rare. Um, and, um, and however, even though it's a huge and uh, uh, sparse graph, uh, then we still uh, argue that there are some clustering structures that you want to ca uh, capture in this uh, graph. So, um, so, so here is the argument, right? So I'm arguing that, I'm arguing that um, the graph distance uh, in this um, graph are semantically meaningful. Um, and, and the clustering structure is also semantically meaningful as a result. So, um, so first of all, if you take two images, right, maybe a dog and a cat. So then these two images are, um, I'm arguing uh, that, that, that these two images are semantically unrelated by right? a cat and dog. I'm arguing that they are very uh, far away in this graph. Uh, and that's just because you know it's very hard to augment uh, one dog into a cat, right? So if you want to find a sequence of images that connects these two dog, this dog and cat, you know, you're gonna find you know it's very hard to find a sequence of images that connects them because you know at some point in the middle of this sequence you will find a unnatural image, right? So some kind of like half dog and half cat, and those kind of images are not natural images anymore. And know that in this graph, I'm only uh, including natural images, right? So, so that's why it's very hard to connect a cat and dog in this image. So uh, on the other hand, um, if you have two dogs, right? Say two French bulldogs, they are uh, not the same French bulldog, but they have the same, they are the same breed. Then you can kind of argue that it's actually uh, possible. Excuse me. I don't think no one, I don't think anyone is talking, so we can carry on. Okay. 
Okay, so um, I guess um, um, so um, if you have two um French bulldogs, they are of the same breed, but um, the same breed, but not um, uh, but they are not the same dog, right? Not even the same color, so and so forth. Still, you can believe that these two uh French bulldogs can be connected by a sequence of bulldogs, and the reason is that you know, I guess you can do this a uh, local small change. Maybe let me just show it, right? So you can imagine that you have a sequence of, um, of small transformations such that you gradually transform one French bulldog to the other French bulldog. And each of these consecutive pairs of images are very close by and they are probably just local small perturbations of each other or they are just a local kind of crop and flip uh, of each other. So by the way, I think in the transformation, uh, in the augmentations, often you have Gaussian perturbations. So basically, if two images are very close to each other, uh, like in L2 uh, sense, then you can kind of say that they are uh, augmentations of each other. And here I'm only showing like a six images, but if you really use a very, very long sequence, then it's probably even easier to connect these two French bulldogs. So, so these two French bulldogs are not directly connected by, with each other because they are pretty far away from each other. So, um, but you can find a sequence of dogs that uh, connects them. So the point here is so, that if no, you have... so just to clarify, um, the node in the graph is the original image or the augmented image. The augmented image. Okay, so in your visualization, for example, your augmented images is actually cropping, right? Right. Right, so a cropping patch, but uh, you are visualizing, let's say, different um, dogs, which is more like uh, global ones. Um, yeah, I think that just for convenience, uh, in the sense that you know, otherwise I have to crop them. Um, but I mean, allowing the augmentations only makes the connection easier because you only need two images to match the parts, right? So, um, so I could just uh, crop. You know, what if I just crop the the central part of all of these images? Um, yeah. Okay. So, so in that sense, okay, so, but if you think about cats, right, so if you also crop, let's say, uh, patches from cat images, and somehow there, there are some kind of cats that uh, actually have parts of the uh, appearance looks very like dogs, so would they be also very close to, let's say, some dogs? Yeah, so, you know, it's possible, right, so, um, but it's just harder, right, because uh, if you want to augment the cats to a dog, you know, it's, um, uh, it's a much, hard, much harder task, because, you know, um, this is actually pretty, this is actually easier to argue than the connectivity. The, the non-connectivity between cats and dog is actually pretty easy to argue. That's because um, if you think about the, um, for example, for, uh, for image net, right? Even you apply your model on the augmented, augmented patches, you actually have very high accuracy. You can probably still achieve more than 90% accuracy. Um, okay, maybe not exactly, you know, depending on which how large the model is, but basically, even you just take a um um a, a, a augmented cat, you can still recover whether it's a cat and dog in most of the cases. So okay. just because the accuracy of on the augmentation is pretty high. So okay. so basically, you, even the augmented cats and the augmented dogs are very separated. There is a there is a clear line between augmented cats and augmented dog. Um. So um. So so, so I think so what you're so, saying so, so doesn't happen very often. So, so this means it depends on the augmentation you are choosing, right? In some sense, yes. if on CIFAR 10 or ImageNet, there is a weird augmentation that actually sort of like uh, uh, decrease accuracy, then that augmentation won't work in your framework. Yep. So, so um, this is all about augmentations, right? So the, so the, the signal, the, the, the learning comes from uh, purely from the augmentations and basically it comes from two things, other augmentations and the data manifold structure. So, mm -hmm. uh, so if your data just covers the whole space, you know, whatever augmentations you have probably doesn't really uh, help that much because, you know, uh, everything's connected with everything. So, so you need the data to come from some manifold such that they are kind of disconnected in some certain sense. They are okay. this. And also you need augmentations to be meaningful. For example, if your augmentations can augment anything to anything, then this wouldn't work. Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So, so yes, that, that's a great point. So the whole point here is like why the augment, in some sense, the augmentation is a local property, right? So it's a lo very local thing. So, um, so it's like the very sparse graph. That's what augmentation is doing, right? So the point here is that why this very local information can be uh, in some sense amplified 
to, to global semantic structure by this algorithm, by this contrastive learning algorithm. Um, and, um, and in some sense, if you just only see the local edge, you, you, you just see some very local information, which doesn't seem to be very helpful. Um, but somehow, if you kind of look at these graphs, this whole graph, you look at the multi hot distance between two images in a graph sense, then the, the graph distance starts to make uh, sense. So, so, so once you are able to somehow uh, go from the local edge to the graph distance, then you get the semantic information. And the, the question is why, um, um, why this uh, contrastive learning can do that? And that's what I'm going to talk about next. So, um, right, so basically the point is going to be that uh, the contrastive learning can capture the graph distance um, uh, in this graph. Um, I'm losing the focus. Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, I, I guess uh, I'm not entirely sure what's exactly the audience here, but uh, if some of you are mathematicians, I think this is actually uh, a, a simple way to think about this is that uh, you can even think this theory even applies to uh, this uh, simplified case, even this lose, you, if you sim consider simplified case, you lose the, some power of the theory, but, um, but it's, it could be interesting for some of the people. So if you assume the augmentations are just Gaussian and, uh, and then this graph is just the so-called proximity or geometric graph where, where you connect nearby points, right? So in this case, pretty much you just get this proximity graph, but your data are not covering the whole uh, space. So that's why you have some manifolds and, and, and uh, you connect the, the, the images within the same manifold. Maybe you have some kind of like, sometimes you have some small number of edges between one manifold to the other manifold, but those are uh, very rare edges. And then if you have stronger augmentation, pretty much you just can connect you know, more points with each other, uh, but the graph is probably still pretty sparse. And, uh, and uh, the assumptions we will make, you know, which I'm not going to probably prove on uh, uh, state very, very carefully, the, the rough uh, assumption we're going to make is just that the inner connectivity within each manifold uh, is going to be much bigger than the interconnected across manifolds. And, um, and uh, in, in this work, if you're familiar with some of the related works, in some sense, the prior works requires the, uh, the clusters to essentially be kind of complete graph um, uh, in the sense that every uh, manifold has a complete graph, but we do require we do allow those graphs to be very very sparse as long as the connectivity uh, is reasonably okay. So um, anyway, this is just uh, one simplified mathematical models. If that helps uh, some people. Um, anyway, okay. So uh, now let's get to the the main theorem we can prove. So basically, what we prove is that if you have infinite data, then um, minimizing the spectral contrast flaws is equivalent to uh, spectral clustering on this positive paragraph up to some rotation. So, and here uh, maybe uh, one um, uh, footnote is that, you know, we analyze this so-called spectral contrast flaws, which is a loss that we propose, uh, which is more in, uh, amenable to um, uh, theoretical analysis, but we also try that it empirically works, you know, almost equally well as some of the, the state-of-art algorithms like SimClear, um, um, Moco and um, SimSam. So this loss is actually simpler than many of those because it didn't involve exponential. It just has like a some inner paradise and square. So the loss has two parts. The first part is about a positive pair where you say you want the augmentations of the um, positive pair to be, um, has, co has high correlation, right? Because you want to minimize the negative of this correlation. And then you also want the, um, the negative pair to have a small correlation because you minimize the correlation square. Okay, so um, so it's the same principle. It's just different kind of like a, I didn't even tell you exactly how people did it in in, uh, in SimClear in some of the other algorithms, but this is the uh, pretty much the same principle. Just we don't have exponentials in SimClear, um, and we have some experiments that shows that you can actually. Um, um, uh, gets very similar performance, sometimes even better performance, you know, with this loss. Um, we're just trying to show that this is um, theoretically a practically relevant loss function to consider. Um, it's just a, 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 um, a variant that um, is meaningful. Actually, it has some small benefits. For example, you can allow small batch compared to SimClear. You don't have any of this momentum encoding, stop grading tricks uh, in BLOL and, um, and SimSam, but those are anyway, not probably very important for this talk, which is more theoretically focused. So, um, and now uh, to parse this theorem, right, we'll have to talk about spectral clustering. Let me just remind you briefly of what spectral clustering is doing. 
So basically, this is um, um, a special costume actually dates back to even early, but uh, uh, she and Marlick and uh, um, and Jory and Wes um, bring them uh, to, in some sense, use them to machine learning in the first uh, uh, time. Um, so so the, the algorithm is like you have a adjacency matrix A, which um, is um, the adjacency matrix of the graph. In our case, you know, this N is pretty much the number of all image patches, which is kind of infinite. So you have an infinite adjacency matrix. And then what you do is you say, you take the top K eigenvectors of this matrix. Um, and, uh, and then this is, uh, and you put them as columns. So basically you get an N by K matrix. And now you look at the rows of this matrix. So you have capital N rows and each row corresponds to one uh, image. So you just say the ith row is the representation of the ith image. So that's the uh, spectral clustering algorithm. So, so, and we are claiming that the spectral clustering algorithm is pretty much what contrastive learning is doing implicitly, uh, even though the contrastive learning is trying to minimize this loss and so forth, right? But here you are just uh, uh, doing spectral clustering. Uh, it's equivalent to doing the spectral clustering. Uh, algorithm. And kind of the intuition uh, is actually pretty simple. So um, especially if you're familiar with spectral clustering. So um, for spectral clustering, you are looking for these eigenvectors, right? So, and what are the properties of the eigenvectors? The, um, it, um, by some very simple spectral graph theory, this is basically spectral graph theory 101. Um, what you know is that um, if you take the eigenvectors, uh, then the eigenvectors actually are uh, has this so-called really quotient formulation. So the eigenvectors are the minimizers of this really quotient formulation. So the eigenvectors, the rows of this um, eigenvector matrix, right? So the rows, the VIs, actually are the minimizers of such a program. The program is just that you want to minimize um, the distance between uh, V and VJ when I and J is a is an edge, and uh, and and uh, and for those of you who are familiar with this, this is actually the trace of the quadratic form on top of the Laplacian. Um, anyway, but this is a pretty much a, sm a simple uh, fact. So you minimize this uh, distance between the pairs, um, and then you insist that the VIs are isotropic, and that means that your VIs are um, the rows of this eigenvector matrix. Okay, and this is what uh, what happens with the I spectral classroom. And on the left hand side, and um, let me remind you what people do with contrastive loss. It's actually pretty much doing the same thing, right? So for the positive pair, you are just uh, finding uh, any edge i and j such that vi is close to vj. So that's the positive pair, which is pretty much the um, uh, which is pretty much the objective uh, on the right hand side. And uh, a negative pair is a bit different, right? So you somehow encourage vi is far away from a random vj. So it turns out that this negative uh, random pair or negative pair uh, constraint um, is pretty much the constraint on the right hand side, even though they are not exactly the same. These are just two equivalent way of saying that you want to encourage the VIs to be diverse enough. So pretty much all of these are doing that. You want the VIs, the embeddings to be close by if they are pairs uh, on positive pairs. And also you want the embeddings to be globally just diverse enough so that they don't collapse to the same uh, uh, vector. And, and this proof is actually just a few lines, like pretty much just the um, just the derived, you know, just the direct derivations. You can prove the equivalence of this. So, okay. So, so so far, I've I've told you that you know the spectral um, um, clustering is the same as contrastive loss, but I haven't said that why these uh, representations are linearly separable, right? So why the you use a spectral clustering? Why the downstream task can be solved linearly? And here's a theorem. Uh, that we prove on this. So you can prove that, you know, if you take this positive paragraph and you assume that the positive paragraph indeed has the, the kind of like the meaningful graph structure as we discussed, right? So you have this R major clusters and the representations that mention is kind of like sufficiently large, larger than the number of major clusters. Then um, linear classifications on the representations can solve any downstream tasks um, such that each cluster has the same label. So basically, as long as you're labeling task uh, in a downstream task, respect the clustering structure uh, in the pre-training, then you can solve those uh, downstream tasks. 
So, so in some sense, this each cluster has the same label. Uh, is the relationship between the task labels and the structure of the pre-trained data. You are saying that the task labels respect the unlabeled structure of the data. And this is also a very simple proof, which I, I'm going to show some you know, intuition for uh, in the next slide. And you just use very simple spectral um, graph theory tools. And, um, and the reason why such a result didn't exist in, in the past is not because it's probably hard. I don't think it's because it's hard to prove. It's just because you know, before the rise of pre-training, right? When people study a special classroom, people don't really think about it as um, you don't do like linear probe on downstream tasks. When people study special classrooms like you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that's a purely unsupervised learning problem. Uh, um, and, and you get the representations and you do some k-means on top of the representations. Nobody does uh, linear uh, representations, linear probe or linear classifications on top of these representations. And this somehow this linear uh, um, probe uh, actually is kind of like a blessing of this um, paradigm and makes the analysis much easier. Okay, so just looking at see. So, um, so the so the downstream sample complexity is um, of k if you have k representations, which is almost obvious because when you do downstream task, you only care about those k dimensional feature, uh, and this is why you gain the sample efficiency, right? So now you only need k samples for the label task instead of like a um, a large number of samples to make the new network generalized. So the intuition here is just that, um, uh, so what's the intuition, why this works, right? So it's actually pretty simple in the extreme case, if you do the, the more sophisticated, it's a bit harder. So in the extreme case, suppose you have very, very disconnected clusters, right? Which is not exactly what we require. We do allow some connections between these clusters, a uh, small number of connections. But suppose you're in the extreme case, you have three completely destroyed cluster um, in this graph. And then what happens is the eigenvectors are pretty much just very structured. We just encode um, the cluster information, right? The first eigenvector is just uh, only supporting the first cluster, and the second eigenvector is supporting the second vector cluster, so on and so forth. And then if you look at the rows of the this uh, matrix, pretty much each row is just the i s um, uh, corresponds to i s image, and it's pretty much just uh, the one hot embedding of the cluster, up to some kind of like a uh, scale. So, um, so basically you get this one hot embedding. Uh, and um, of course, you know, the real world is not simple, as simple as this because uh, the equivalence between class contrastive laws and spectral clustering is not uh, exact, it's up to rotation. So basically eventually your representations will be a rotation of this matrix. That's why you don't see exactly the sparse structure. Um, nevertheless, the hidden spark structure let you basically say that every Embedding is pretty much just a, a one hot embedding of the cluster ID up to rotation. So, and that means that these, they are linearly separable, right? So basically, if you just uh, um, um, look at each of these coordinates, you get, uh, that's a linear classifier, you get the cluster ID. So that's why this is linearly separable. Um, I guess I don't have a lot of time, so I probably sk skip the proof sketch um, for how does this work. Um, and one kind of like a confusing and, um, uh, and also interesting thing about this is that um, actually it also works, the same thing also works for the case when you have like polynomial number of samples where the uh, is polynomial in the complexity of the graph. So, um, and this is often kind of like a, a mysterious in some sense because here you are leveraging the extrapolation of the networks in some way. So, so basically, suppose you have a population graph, right? So I've already told you all of this theory, but what if you have an empirical graph, right? So you only have like a polynomial number of empirical samples. And you know that if you sample empirical number of samples, a polynomial number of samples, you don't really cover this graph very well. Um, and this is known in the manifold learning kind of like a, a literature, you know, 20 years ago, if you do, uh, a, uh, you have the curse of dimensionality, right? So if you just sample this kind of, uh, from this graph, you never see a connected graph just because all the points are very far away in your samples. So, so basically what you see in the empirical graph is just like this, is a, a bunch of disconnected pairs. Um, you never even have two edges that connect to each other. So, and why this still can work when you have empirical samples? 
the first out of bed, I think it's just that the reason is that uh, you never really work with the um, the, the non-parametric contrast learning. So we don't apply, uh, so we, we don't apply the the answer, the the, the non-parametric uh, clustering uh, on the empirical graph. So we only show that the the equivalence for the population graph. So um, it doesn't really mean that if you do contrastive learning on the empirical graph is equivalent to doing special clustering on the empirical graph. So so this is because the parametrization actually helps you in some sense, right? So um, so basically what happens is that if you apply contrastive learning uh, on the, so basically what we have told you is that the population graph and the non-parametric approach of the contrastive learning is the same as the spectral clustering with the non-parametric approach, right? So non-parametric just means that you have one representation for every possible image, right? So they don't have any relationship. And the parametric approach means that uh, you parametrize the contrastive uh, on the representation by uh, a new network on the raw data XI. So you have a mapping from the XI to the raw data. So, um, so we know that this equivalence, and now if you uh, focus on the contrastive learning world, you have also that uh, if you apply the parametric uh, contrastive learning where you learn the new network, then if you assume this new network is powerful enough that implements the eigenvectors, then you know that the parametric uh, uh, algorithm on a population graph is the same as the non-parametric algorithm on a population graph because you just uh, assume realizability. And the, once you move to the population world, uh, parametric world, then you can say that the parametric uh, loss on the population graph is the same as the parametric loss on the empirical graph. And this is because you have the concentration inequality, right? So of the loss function, right? So you don't care about the graph's concentration, you care about the loss function's concentration. And because the loss function is parametric, then you can prove the concentration in the cloud. And um, um, however, uh, if you apply the non-parametric approach on the empirical graph, just never, it doesn't work for both contrastive learning and uh, spectral clustering. So, um, so, so it's when you use the empirical graph, you have to use the parametric approach. And that's the kind of the, uh, the interesting thing about this, somehow, if you use the parametric approach, you can actually learn from this very disconnected empirical graph. Okay, so um, I think I'm running late a little bit. So um, I guess um, the second uh, uh, follow-up work that we, um, we are doing here is that actually you can use this kind of framework to even study other properties of the embeddings um, from the contrastive learning. And one of the properties we study is that they actually the embedding space also capture relationship. So, so, so maybe let's consider this kind of like cases where you have four clusters and these four clusters have some, some kind of like structure. So at least it's semantically. So um, you have two domains and two classes, sketch and real and butterfly and clock. So this could give you like a two by two grid in some sense semantically. So you have this uh, 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 four clusters, right? But these four clusters, you know, if you, just apply our previous um, uh, theory, um, you don't have any kind of like ways to tell that these four clusters are actually semantically two by two kind of like um, uh, grid. So you just don't know anything about any an relationship about them. So you just treat them as four separate clusters. Then you just uh, map them to some kind of like four separate clusters. And, uh, and the previous theory says that if the, um, the cross edges, you know, the intercluster edges is um, uh, smaller, much smaller than the inner connection, then you have this linear separability. So that's the conclusion of the previous theory. But actually you can do a little better to even capture um, even more um, subtle uh, relationship. So it turns out that actually, if you really run the experiments, you see this kind of like a, um, a very aligned structure of these four clusters in the Euclidean space. They are not just a red four random um, point clouds, what you really have is that they are in the Euclidean space, they are aligned in this kind of two by two way uh, in the sense that, you know, there's a domain direction, there's a class direction, and somehow the, um, the, there's a transferability. So basically, if you have a linear classifier on top of the first two domain, the, 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 the sketch butterfly and sketch clock, then that same linear classifier transfers to um, a real butterfly versus real clock. 
So, so, so this you have this kind of like a, a corresponding alignment in the Euclidean space. And uh, actually, if you take standard theory in the um, uh, in the in the previous framework in some way, then what we prove is that um, if you have the fall the, the graph has the following property. If the graph satisfies that the blue edges is bigger than uh, better than the pink edges, uh, is more than the pink edges, the blue edges are the edges that either have one different domain or the edges that connects uh, points with one different class, right? So, uh, and these blue edges, if they are bigger, then when you change to both the domain um, um, classes, right, the pink edges, right? So if the number of blue edges is bigger than the number of pink edges, then uh, uh, you also have this additional alignment structure. So in some sense, you can turn the graph structure uh, into more subtle uh, and the uh, graph structure into more subtle um, uh, Euclidean structures in the embedding space. And if you actually use this algorithm, like we have one paper that is more applied in on that I cited here. So actually you can get even um, SOTA performance on unsupervised domain adaptation um, um, compared to many of the, um, the all the pre previous kind of like uh, uh, unsupervised domain adaptation algorithm. This is a very simple algorithm. You just pre on all unlabeled data and then you do this linear probe um, or fine tuning and then you get the, uh, the SOTA performance. Um, I think I only have like nine minutes. So I'm going to just probably cover the second part very quickly. Um, so, um, so actually, you know, we study, um, so basically we talk about uh, pre-training laws and but um, in some of the follow-up works, you know, in the last two, one or two years, we started to think about, you know, other kind of like more nuanced perspective in this pre-trained uh, representation. Um, because some of this kind of like technical details actually matters because you know what architecture use matters, what implicit bias, what algorithms optimizers use um, does matter. So it's not only about the laws and the data. So uh, how do you um, um, get some handle or understanding about those kind of like factors, even though they are probably not the, the, the exact the first or the best, right? So um, we realized that you know they actually at least first of all they do matter because even if you have two models with the same partition loss, you could possibly have slightly different downstream performance, right? So you can have model one which is a ResNet, model two which is a vision transformer, and uh, they have similar loss, the population partition loss, but they still have different downstream performance, which means that this model architecture also actually matters. Um, and um, the question is, you know, how does they come into play, right? So I think one limitation of the work that I have told you is that uh, we require the embedding dimension to be much larger than the dimension of the clusters, the number of clusters in the graph. And we need the, uh, suppose R is the number of clusters, then we need polynomial number of samples, and we need the dimension of the embedding to be larger than R. And the question is why R is huge? What if R is huge? And in this case, actually inductive facts can come to, re to rescue and make things much better. So, um, so this is actually an example that um, uh, one of the work by Songshi et al. shows. So they show that actually you can do much better if you restrict your model class to be linear in certain cases. So um, this is, um, um, uh, maybe I'll just show this very quickly. So um, suppose you have just four points. These are four raw data points. And the augmentation is that you augment these four points to these right points where you perturb on the horizontal direction. And you can imagine that the, the, the horizontal direction is kind of like the sparse direction because that direction, you, if you perturb the data points, you don't change the class. And in, in the other direction, it's kind of more intrinsic direction, which where uh, perturbation of the augmentation doesn't change the, uh, the, the, um, the, 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 the that direction, right? So that's the more invariant direction. And um, so you have four clusters here, obviously. And um, if you have linear models somehow, it turns out that you only need one dimension one, um, but if you use an arbitrary model, then you need uh, K to be larger than R. And the reason that you only need one is just because the only way you can project this to one dimension is this uh, way that you kind of project to the, um, to the intrinsic dimension. So you get this embeddings, which is a scalar, and the scalar uh, captures this uh, uh, structure of the, the graph, the intrinsic dimension pretty well. So uh, I guess, um, 
probably I'm not going to get into more details. So, um, so basically what we are saying is that, um, so this is a problem for us, right? In the sense that this is kind of like a counter example for, for our previous work in the sense that uh, it shows that the previous work is not uh, tight enough. Um, it shows that, you know, even though in, in some cases you can get away with, you know, much smaller dimension um, uh, of the representation compared to the number of clusters. Um, and um, uh, so basically we have uh, uh, improved the kind of like uh, um, theory that actually captures this kind of like a model, um, model class, you know, in a more stronger way. So what we are saying is that, you know, if you, um, consider graph partition, right? So if you partition this graph in an arbitrary way, you have four ways to uh, four clusters. But however, if you use linear models, then you actually cannot partition it uh, into, uh, uh, there are not that many possible partitions. So, so we have this notion called model implement for graph partitions. So for example, this partition, even though it's a great partition of the graph, but it's actually not implementable by a linear model if you don't have the threshold. Here I'm talking about literally linear models without a threshold. That's just because if you want a linear model to implement a label here, then it's a contradiction because the left top corner are all ones. And because they are a linear model, so you should linearly extrapolate to the left bottom corner um, just because they are on the same linear line, right? If you see a bunch of ones on the same line, then a linear function would extrapolate to the entire line uh, so that the entire line is a constant. So, so that's why this is not uh, linearly uh, implementable. And uh, this is not linearly implementable. This is also not linearly implementable for the same reason, because the top left corner should extrapolate to the top bottom, to the bottom left corner if it's really a linear function. So the only linearly implementable uh, partition is this. So that means that the number of linearly implementable partition is much smaller than the total number of partitions. You will have one partition here instead of like two to the four partitions, um, if you can partition anyway. So, so that's, um, that's reduced the complexity of this. So, and uh, in some sense, basically the final, the new theory is that suppose you have a model class, then you can say that R is the number of major clusters and you define R zero to be the number of major clusters implementable by the uh, function class. And the new theory says that we only need dimension K to be larger than the number of major clusters that are implementable. R zero instead of K is larger than R and all the sample complexity and polynomials are polynomials in R zero. So, um, um, and uh, we also proved that, you know, in some synthetic case, actually R zero can be much, much smaller than R, for example, the examples in Sanshi et al and many other examples. So basically this is saying that um, 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 you, you, when you introduce the, the model class, actually you can make the, uh, the dimension uh, of the representation and the sample class, a uh, sample complexity uh, smaller. Um, okay, so um, okay, so maybe I should just uh, um, skip the next. Uh, actually, also have uh, some kind of like uh, ex experiments that shows that the best uh, R way model implementable partition is much. Uh, 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 you can compute this, and it's um, uh, it's actually a small uh, number for. Uh, well, small, R is small, and uh, if you try too, uh, too many, too big of R's, then the, it's very hard to partition with the model. So it turns out that you know, um, you indeed um, the 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 model implement for partition is actually um, um, give you very small number of clusters. So maybe I'll skip this as well. So um, and this, the second part, the third part, I, I probably just talk about it um, um, uh, without any details. So pretty much we also find out that the algorithm also affects the, the pre-training uh, performance. Even you have the same architecture, you have the same pre-training loss, still the optimizer is actually uh, changing things. And the optimizer seems to have the same type of implicit bias as the implicit bias in deep learning theory, um, where you prefer kind of flat local minimum, so on and so forth. Um, and that's the third part, which I probably will skip. Um, okay, so just a summary, so I guess, um, um, so we proved that contrast plus is kind of the same as spectral clustering or positive paragraph if you have infinite data, and then you can deal with the finite uh, data with this uh, off the shelf kind of concentration inequality if you use um, uh, the parametric way um, um, in contrast loss. And then we, as a follow-up work, we consider other more um, 
um, detailed representation uh, properties about the representations, for example, whether it can disentangle class and domain information. And, um, and when you have uh, some architecture um, that introduces some implicit inductive bias, then um, the, the only the model implementable clusters are matter, so you get a tighter bound. Um, and this is the part I sl uh, skip where we said that uh, ICD biases towards flight models in self-supervised learning and the flatness correlates with the performance, uh, even when the pre-training loss, when the pre-training loss is near optimal. Um, I guess I, um, I think I'm exactly about time. So maybe I would just uh, put the open question on the slides and uh, stop here and answer some questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tang Yu, for the very interesting talk. Okay, so um, I think we start a little bit late. So we probably have, let's say, uh, three to four minutes for questions. Um, if anyone wants to ask questions, you can just uh, uh, raise your hand or type your question uh, into the chat. I can start with one, okay. So you mentioned that uh, these, uh, to, the gap to close between, let's say, the population one and the um, empirical one, right, is by this concentration inequality. So I buy that in terms of like the, the loss function. Uh, but maybe I'm just not uh, known uh, well enough in terms of this spectral graph or considering that uh, say um, how small this sort of like loss is uh, small in order to say you somehow recover, let's say the uh, uh, graph structure. Right, right. So that's a great question. So you need a loss and you need differences of the loss to be small enough so that you can allow on, um, uh, you, ha you have to pay an eigen gap. So basically, so basically, if you are epsilon, epsilon away from the minimizers um, of the eigenvectors, so then um, you pay epsilon over the eigengap mm. uh, in the final um, bound. So we, we have a, we have an end to end characterization in the in the in the, in the, in, the, in the paper, so you can see um, the effect of everything. So it, we do we do have an end to end bound. I think the dependency pretty much is the eigengap uh, of the graph. And the eigengap is actually just relates to the, um, the, the classroom structure, right? So, so if you have stronger classroom structure, you have fewer um, connections um, between the different clusters and uh, you have more inner connections within the cluster then you have stronger eigengap. Uh, and I think the eigengap it also doesn't have to be like, um, um, like it's it, it's not like it's it's I think it's a reasonably well assumption. Um, like that eigengap is small because, um, like essentially, basically, we assume that the inner connectivity is bigger than the interclass connectivity, and uh, um, so 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 that's um that's pretty much what we assume. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess. Okay, did I answer the question? Yes, oh, yes, oh, oh, yes, almost. Okay, so I guess this kind of I can get right depends on uh, your data. So, so we, we, you cannot change data too much, but you can change the augmentation, yeah. right? So, um, in your opinion, and also like in your observations from your research, right? So, um, what kind of uh, augmentations, right? Or, or at least how to choose augmentation so that uh, you can have these nice uh, zero properties, like this small item gap. Yeah, so I guess um, um, in some sense, the hope is that this, uh, this understanding will help us understanding, uh, answer your question. Um, but I don't think you have a theoretical way to do that. In per no, intuitively, what the work is saying is that you want augmentations to be able to connect um, semantically related things um, better and also don't, don't connect anything that are semantically uh, unrelated. So you just want this augmentation to have more to, to give more uh, stru um, classroom structure in the graph, right? So, but how do you do that? That's a kind of like a probably open question, right? How do you, for example, automatically select augmentation such that the classroom structure of the graph is stronger? I don't think I have a way to do that, but you probably could, uh, you know, as a pure practitioner, I think probably one can just use some intuition, right? So if my augmentation somewhat connect more semantic related objects um, and uh, connect less and semantic unrelated objects and that's that's better <laughs> that's pretty much what we have today. okay well i guess we are out of time okay uh and also there's no questions in the chat okay anyway so yeah thanks a lot thank you for your great talk okay so yeah and also thanks everyone for attending so 
uh, watch out your email box and then we will see uh, you in the uh, next call. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks.